Hi everyone, I'm Neil Madden. I'm the author of API Security in Action and I'm giving a talk at Manning's Conference on APIs and I'll be doing a deep dive into OAuth 2 scopes and how best to use them to secure access to your APIs. Hi everyone, my name is Neil Madden. I'm the author of API Security in Action and today I'm going to be talking about OAuth 2 and particularly about OAuth 2 scopes and how you can best use those to um, secure access to your APIs. So what is OAuth 2? So lots of you are probably already familiar with OAuth 2, but I'll give it a very short uh, refresher here in case you've forgotten some of the details. So the problem that OAuth was originally designed to solve, you know, over a decade ago now, was um, you know, how if you've got a service like LinkedIn that wants to get access to your contacts in Gmail, say, so to see if you've got other colleagues who are already on, on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, how do you give LinkedIn that access without giving them your password to Gmail? In which case they could not only read your contacts, but also read all your emails and, and uh, send emails from your account. So we, we'd like to not just rely on LinkedIn being, being well behaved here. We'd like to be able to actually say, you know, you can only read my contacts. Uh, and so OAuth solves this problem then by um, uh, instead of giving them your password, you, you instead give them an, an opaque token, which is called an access token, which is a, you know, a short random string that they can then use to access the Gmail API. And that token has associated with it a scope which says what level of access they should actually have. And so it looks a bit something like this. So, you know, you've got an app in this case, you know, it's an app on your phone, but it could be an app running on a server in the cloud or, or elsewhere. Uh, and you want to use that app to access some of your resources on some API. So this might be the LinkedIn app that's trying to access the Gmail API to access your contacts, for instance. Uh, and then rather, so rather than asking you for your password, the app is going to do, it's going to talk to an authorization service. This would be Google's authorization server in the case of Gmail. And it's going to say, you know, I want to be able to access this user's um, contacts. And then the authorization is, server is going to talk to that user. So typically through the, the web browser on the, on the same device in this case and say, you know, is it okay if this LinkedIn app accesses your um, contacts? Uh, and so that's the scope of access that the app is asking for, is, is saying, you know, I want read-only access to your contacts. And if the user approves that, then the authorization server will issue this uh, access token and optionally something else called a refresh token to the app. Uh, and then the app can use that access token to access the, the API. And that scope that's encoded into the access token, when you access the API using that access token, the API can check that scope and say, you know, um, make sure you're, the app is not trying to access anything that it shouldn't be allowed to do according to that scope. So in OAuth, these, these four entities have special names. These are their role names within OAuth. Um, so we'll just recap this because it's... Uh, uh, terms I'll use later on. So the user then is known as the resource owner. So it's assumed that it's their resources that the app is trying to access. And those resources that live in the API live on something called a resource server. So that's just the, the name for the API. Um, and then the app itself is the client in OAuth 2 speak. Uh, and then you've got the authorization server. So these four things, so resource owner, resource server, client, and authorization server. But what actually is a scope? You know, this crucial thing that, it, that is defining the level of access that, a, that an API has, um, uh, that a client has to an API, uh, is defined by this scope. So I'm not expecting you to read this wall of text here, by the way. This is an excerpt from RFC 6749, which, um, if that doesn't immediately ring any bells, that's the uh, OAuth 2 specification uh, published in 2012. Uh, which defines all of these flows and has this short section here which which talks about access token scope and what this crucial scope parameter is. So pull out a few key quotes from here then. So it says the authorization and token endpoints, which are uh, endpoints on the authorization server itself, allow the client to specify the scope of the access request using the scope request parameter. Okay, but what actually is it then? 
And so it goes on to say the value of the scope parameter is expressed as a list of space delimited case sensitive strings. The strings are defined by the authorization server. So that is pretty much all that the O2 spec says about scope, which is not a lot. Uh, I think you'll agree. But it says that they're strings. So each scope is a string. Uh, and what these strings mean is defined by the authorization server. And really, it's also defined by the resource server, which ultimately is going to enforce these scope restrictions. OK, so if the scope the spec doesn't say much, do other sources say any more? So if we go to, say, OAuth.net, which is a kind of central website for OAuth, so it says the scope is a mechanism in OAuth2 to limit an application's access to a user's account. An application can request one or more scopes. This information is then presented to the user in a consent screen, and the access token issued to the application will be limited to the scopes granted. So this gives you a bit more hint about what it's what it's intended for. So, you know, these these scopes are decisions that a user is going to have to make about the level of access they want to grant. Uh, and important as well in that is is the idea that that scopes the client needs to know ahead of time what scopes it's going to have to ask for, which suggests that the the scopes must be documented somewhere. So there must be a kind of static list of them somewhere that the app developer can find out about. So let's look at some examples then. So if you look at Google Cloud Platform, so this is Google's you know, cloud offering, has hundreds of APIs. You can go and um, if you search for Google Cloud Platform OAuth um, scopes, uh, you'll find this page and they list you know, dozens or hundreds of APIs and all of the individual scopes for those APIs that you can request from their authorization server. And in this case, Google have decided that these scope strings are going to be URIs. So they're not they're not URLs. I don't think you can go and access these and, and get anything particularly useful back. But they're URIs. So they're just kind of structured identifiers. Um, and they, they've used URIs just to make them kind of unam unambiguous. They've kind of broken this down and you get different types of APIs. So here we've got two on the right here. We've got the Firebase Rules API which is a kind of infrastructure API, which is kind of used behind the scenes. Uh, and typically what's going to be connecting to it will be some other service. So using some kind of service account. Users wouldn't typically, you know, directly care about this Firebase Rules API. Whereas underneath it here, we've got the Fitness API, which is all about granting access to users' individual fitness data. So things like their heart rate, their activity levels, blood glucose, and, and things like this. Uh, and so this is much more uh, about user data and users are going to be much more particularly uh, interested in, in what kind of data is shared from that API. And so you can see that the Fire Ace Rules API just has a couple of scopes here. It has three scopes. Um, so there's one that grants access to, to the whole API, one that grants read-only access, and then there's this other one, uh, Cloud Platform, that I'll talk about in a minute. Whereas the fitness API, uh, you can't see it here on this screen, but it stretches down and there's, there's, there's a couple of dozen, I think, scopes defined by this API. And they're a much finer level of access. So individual read and write access to, to specific kind of um, fitness indicators. So activity, blood glucose, uh, heart rate, things like that. And so it's much more broken down. So when, when a user is going to have to make a decision about what they allow access to, um, and when the user is going to care about that decision, then things are broken down into a really fine grain level. Otherwise, they're left as a re really broad level. Um, and there's also this interesting, they have this kind of God scope, which is this one right at the top here where it says uh, cloud platform, which, which in theory grants access to the whole of the cloud, the Google cloud platform. Uh, but in reality, it doesn't because that is limited by other authorization mechanisms. We'll talk about this kind of layering of OAuth on top of other authorization mechanisms later on in the talk. So another example then, if you look at Dropbox, um, file storage. So again, they've got scopes as, as strings, but this time they're not using URIs. They're using a kind of structured string format. Um, where they have uh, typically like the, the resource that's being accessed, like account info or files or sharing, uh, and then some kind of action that you're going to perform on that. So read or write. Uh, they actually have a very consistent use of actions they use here. So read, write, list, delete, modify. Uh, and then sometimes they break it down even more. So for files, they say 
you know, can you access the content or just the metadata? And so they have different scopes for those things. But again, it's quite similar to Google here. You've got you've got the scopes encoding, you know, what API you're accessing and what what permissions you're going to have on that API, what actions you can perform. So GitHub, another example here. So here again, scopes are structured strings. They're a bit less consistent than Dropbox. I suspect these scopes have kind of evolved a bit more organically over time. Um, so sometimes you see, you know, uh, action colon resource, and sometimes you've got action underscore resource, and sometimes the action and the resource are kind of switched around. Uh, so it's a bit less consistent here. But again, it's got kind of got this this um, thing that it's the scope is identifying which API is being accessed uh, and what action you're allowed to perform. Um, so you know, read user, you can read a, a user's profile data, um, and then sometimes it's broken down to specific fields like you know user email, which again you know the the read there is kind of uh, implicit there rather than um, adding it on. They have this uh, interesting idea of kind of hierarchical scopes. So rather than requesting access to read user, user email, user follow, individually, you can just request this user scope, which kind of implies the others, uh, which is kind of an interesting um, approach. So if we look at these kind of um, compare them, we can see there's, there's a kind of common approach here in that uh, the scope is encoding which API is being accessed or which type of resources are being accessed, so whether it's users or messages or fitness or you know Firebase or whatever. Uh, and then the actions that are that are being allowed, whether that's read, write, delete, you know, list, modify, whatever. And, and then sometimes they break it down into more fine-grained specific fields that you can have access to. And that and that's typically broken down then where it is something that a user is going to care about the distinction there. So the user might not care that you know their name, but they might care a lot whether you get their email address, for instance. So is this enough? Is this if if you're going to use OAuth 2 to provide you know, to enforce your authorization to access your APIs, is, is this enough information in these scopes? You often see people who want to use OAuth 2 uh, and just purely use OAuth 2 scopes as the only means of, of um, securing access to APIs. Um, so let's let's have a look at an example then. So here's Alice. Um, she's using some kind of client and she's got an OAuth 2 access token uh, that she's approved with the messages.read scope here. Uh, and then she, she makes a, a request to the API to read her messages using, using this access token. So she makes a, a get request to slash users slash Alice slash messages with this access token, or rather her client does on her behalf, uh, and gets back her messages. But then what if her client or her just changes the Alice in that in that URI to, to some other user ID like Bob? And it's quite common for the URIs that you're accessing an API to have to have identifiers in them that, that are, are very easy to guess. You can you can guess somebody else's user identifier, or you know, uh, let's say it's a document and, and it's using the database ID, which is just a sequential number. So you can easily guess other other IDs for other documents. <clears throat> so, you know, if we look at this, if we just look at the scope, then the scope says messages.read, and it doesn't really say it should only be Alice's messages that, that she can read. And so if we're only using the access token scope to, to grant access, then um, we might have a problem here. And in fact, people often do have this problem, and it's uh, it's such a common problem in, in web application security that it's got a special name, and its name is IDOR. Um, and that stands for insecure direct object reference. Uh, and this is the idea that um, uh, you're not really checking properly uh, what object somebody is trying to access. Uh, and so if they can guess the URI for a different object, um, then they might be granted access to it when they should have been denied. So here, you know, she changes Alice to Bob in the URI. And because we're only checking that she has the read read messages scope, uh, then she gets back Bob's messages. And this seems like a daft uh, uh, kind of vulnerability, but it's actually so common that it was, for a while, it was it had its own category in the OWASP top 10. So if you're not familiar with the OWASP top 10, OWASP is the Open Web Application Security Project, and they publish this top 10 periodically of the most common web application vulnerabilities. So if you're, if you're new to application security, it's well worth kind of 
uh, uh, searching for that and having a look. So it's not the be all and end all of security, as I said, but it's it, it gives you an idea of what some of the most common vulnerabilities are and what things to look out for. And this, as I said, this used to be its own category. It's now been merged into a broader category of uh, broken access control. But it's, it's, it's this basic idea that if you're not not checking, you know, who has access to what, you're just saying, you know, something like, well, they've got access to the messages API and the read um, access you know, encode in this OAuth 2 scope, then they might be able to then read other people's messages. So relying purely on OAuth scopes for authorization can lead to these kind of idle vulnerabilities because the way that OAuth scopes are typically designed doesn't encode a lot of these extra details about, you know, exactly whose messages should be granted access to. So what are these other details? So if you look at the traditional kind of components of making an authorization decision, uh, they kind of break down into these four categories that are required to make a good authorization decision. So this is uh, information about the subject, so who is trying to perform this request, who is who is trying to get access to something. The resource, what are they trying to access? Is it some photos? Is it a document? Is it, you know... Uh, some payroll data or, or whatever. Uh, what action they're actually trying to perform, whether they're trying to read or write or modify or delete. And then typically some environmental or context specific um, information. So, you know, where are they trying to um, gain access from? You know, are they, are they trying to access from home when actually this is only allowed for internal users on an internal network, say? Uh, or are they accessing at a weird time of day? And that feeds into some kind of decision process that then makes is going to make some kind of allow deny decision. And, and here I'm not talking about any specific technology for making that decision. So this could be something like access control lists or some kind of permission system. It could be role-based access control or attribute-based access control. Or it could just be a bunch of ad hoc rules that you've kind of hard-coded into your application. But the point is that you should be making a decision based on uh, at least some of these broad categories of, of um, information. Whereas when you try and just use OAuth scopes for this, at least how they're typically used, then you're, you're throwing away a lot of this information and you're only getting some partial information to use to make that request. So you typically, you know, the scope doesn't encode anything about the user typically because the scopes are, are a static list that you can go and read on the documentation for an API. Uh, and they d they don't typically encode the user. Uh, they typically only encode part of the resource, so it will typically say which type of resource is being accessed, but not which specific resource. So you know, if you've got a document read scope, which documents should you be able to read? Um, they they do typically encode the action pretty well, uh, but they also then don't encode any kind of context specific uh, information about the request. So you're really limiting yourself if you just use scopes. So could you encode all of that information into scopes? And I've seen people try and do this and try and cram. There'd be very complicated encoding schemes where they try and cram all this information into a scope. And in theory, you know, you could you could try and do this. You know, strings can be arbitrarily complicated. You can add whatever information you want. But it becomes, you know, much more difficult to enforce this. Uh, and in particular, when you think about things like documents, which are shared resources that many users might have access to, how is the authorization server supposed to know who has access and, and who doesn't and what scopes are appropriate and, and, and not? And the only way it's really going to know that is by kind of reaching into your data model behind the scenes and kind of looking at relationships between things and trying to work out who should have access, which, which kind of creates then a very tight coupling between your authorization server and the rest of your um, your, your applications and your APIs, which can make things very brittle to change over time. Uh, and you've also got to think about, you know, what if those permissions change after the token is issued? When you issue a, an access token to something like a mobile app or something like a, a TV set-top box, you know, when you log into Netflix or something, it, it um, gets an access token that it's going to use to access your, your account. Uh, and those tokens can live for a very long time. Uh, typically, you know, potentially multiple years. So, um, and so, if you think about, you know, if Alice has access to this document when when the token is issued, is she still going to have access to that document two years down the line? Uh, because the scopes that are issued in the token are, are fixed for the life of that token. 
Um, and so, um, and if you try and revoke the token uh, when her permissions change, that means she's just going to end up having to log in again all, all the time. So, uh, so trying to encode too much into scopes can make your application very brittle. So there is a, a, a new specification coming down the line, which I'll just mention briefly here. It's called Rich Authorization Requests, or RA, which is currently going through the OAuth Working Group, uh, which uh, enhances OAuth with, um, uh, with this idea of authorization details, where you can pass in structured JSON saying exactly what is being um, uh, asked for. Uh, and in this case, you know, this can be a very, very detailed, unique uh, object for each transaction. So it's kind of designed for open banking and and, and payment transactions and things like that. Uh, so, so in the future, it might be possible to do make these more kind of fine grained decisions purely based on on this uh, uh, scope thing. But I would say that this still has, in my opinion, some of the, the issues I just pointed out on the last slide. So what should you be able to doing then? So um, one thing you can think about doing is layering OAuth over some other authorization mechanism. So rather than trying to do everything with scopes, you do some things with scopes and then other things with a more traditional um, authorization process. Um, so you, you, you uh, a client accesses an API with an access token. You're going to validate that access token, check it's not expired or whatever, and check it was issued by uh, the correct authorization server. And then from that validation step, you're going to get back the, the, the scope of that token and who the resource owner was. And then you can check the scope and say, you know, is that scope appropriate for the action that's being performed against this type of resource? And if it isn't, then you can abort. Otherwise, you go through to a more traditional authorization decision where you take the resource owner from that access token, so who originally approved that access token, and say, you know, would they have access to this thing anyway? So if this is this is Alice's access token, does she have access to Bob's messages? Well, no. So it would be denied there, where she does have access to her own messages. And so you layer OAuth on top of an existing authorization um, process. So some key takeaways here then. So so keep it simple, I'd say. You know, um, do this thing. Don't try and solve everything in OAuth 2 scopes. Um, you know, layer OAuth on top of some other um, more fine-grained authorization mechanism that's built into your app itself, built into your API, uh, and and then keep it simple. So follow these these examples from Google and Dropbox and, and GitHub and so on because they have converged on this common approach, uh, which is a kind of sweet spot for for scope design, which is that you. You use scopes only to distinguish between a particular API or resource type uh, and the actions that can be performed. And you only break it down into more detail where, where that's a decision that a user is going to care about. So particularly when sharing access to their specific data. And avoid these IDOR vulnerabilities, these insecure direct object references, by making sure that you're not just using the scope as the sole um, indicator of whether whether a request should be allowed. Okay, that's my takeaways for scope design for security. If you have any questions, um, ask in the chat and I'll um, hang around to take any questions. Thank you very much.